Okay, thank you. Uh, as uh, I said, I'm James Swain. Uh, so, uh, as we all know, parallelizing legacy code is very hard. Uh, and when you're talking about uh, adapting a runtime system that was designed for a single processor to support parallelism, uh, the story is even worse. So, uh, usually if we don't want to just entirely drop all the implementation code that we had, uh, and we want to actually modify an existing runtime to support this kind of thing, we usually end up writing code that uses lots of blocks to protect access to all of our global data structures, things like that. And usually what we end up with is something like this. So this is obviously not a good solution. Uh, we, it's very tedious. Uh, it's very slow in terms of development time. Uh, it's error prone, and it usually doesn't yield the, the most efficient solution. Uh, but fortunately, uh, runtime systems do have some structure that we can exploit to do something a little bit better. So the structure that I talk about is based upon this idea of the fast path, which we're probably all familiar with, uh, which is an optimized implementation of some commonly used primitive. So one property of fast paths <coughs> is that they tend not to use global variables. So ideally, in a good fast path, we like to have all of our values in registers, and then we just use a few simple instructions to accomplish something. So I'll show you a quick example uh, from Racket. So this is the fast path for plus. This is five instructions. Uh, very fast, very efficient. Uh, meanwhile, here's the scenic group uh, for plus in Racket. So this is on the order of something like two or 300 instructions. Uh, much, much slower. So we can make an observation about fast and slow paths based on this property, right? Uh, generally, if, if fast paths aren't accessing global data, writing to global data, uh, they don't have any side effects with respect to runtime state. So, in that sense, only slow path primitives are preventing us from unrestricted parallelism. So this is the basic idea that, that we use to build the, the parallel rocket implementation. Uh, so what we did is we categorized all the primitives in the language into three broad categories. Uh, so I'll kind of briefly describe how each one behaves. So first, this is the, the safe category. This is a fast path operation. Uh, so what we do is we, we only give the programmer one operation uh, to spawn a parallel task, and that's a future, uh, which you're probably all aware of. So we have two primitives, future and touch. Uh, so future will spawn a parallel task, and then touch, we've, we require an explicit touch on all futures. Uh, so here, Future is being called on uh, this OS thread. Uh, and also, I should mention here, we have a special runtime OS thread that's dedicated to always servicing slow path calls and all touches as well. So we call future on the runtime thread. Uh, this worker thread here begins to run this code in parallel. Meanwhile, at some point later on the runtime thread, we touch this future. Uh, and though this future doesn't block, we still have to wait here uh, until the completion of that future. <coughs> so here's a uh, more interesting category, the, what we call a barricaded operation. And this is any slow path uh, that, we, that is known to be, to be unsafe to run in parallel. It might have side effects. Uh, so here, uh, it's a little more complicated. So we have, again, a future being spawned, and it begins on the worker thread, until at this point, it hits a barricaded a slow path operation. So the future here blocks, is suspended, uh, until the touch point, which runs on the runtime, th runtime thread. And so within the scope of this touch, we see that there's a barricade pending. So we run the barricade out on the runtime thread. Uh, and then at that point, the future can continue, but still the runtime thread is forced to wait for this thing to finish. So essentially what, what happens here when you get a barricade is you're sequentializing the remainder of a future computation. So you lose all parallelism. Now you could, you could get away with just these two categories, right? You can only treat, you can run fast paths that are safe in the safe way and then slow paths in the barricaded way. But in practice, that's not really, not really an option. Uh, there are certain types of primitives, and this kind of looks red here, but there should be, there should be orange dots. Uh, there are certain types of primitives that really aren't they're not even really primitives, they're more just operations that are unsafe. Uh, but we, we would like to be able to run them 
and not lose all, kill all of our parallelism. Uh, and certain things that are sort of opaque to the programmer, we, we try to do this with. So we call this an atomic operation. Uh, so here, this thread, the future on this thread wants to allocate memory. Memory allocation is one of these, an example of this. So because it's not always obvious where your program might allocate, and usually in functional programs there's a lot of allocation going on. Uh, so what we do here, uh, the runtime thread will periodically check to see if there are any futures uh, out there with pending atomic operations, so like pending memory allocations. And if so, the future will pause to wait till this thing completes, uh, just as in with the barricade. So here the runtime thread sees that allocation is pending, allocates a new memory page for the future, and at this point, the, the future can continue in parallel. So those are the three, the three basic uh, categories. So the story doesn't end there, right? So often this can be a very confusing uh, implementation to work with, right? So it, if you're not a, an experienced racket programmer, you may not, may not be obvious why you're not getting any speed up. Uh, so you, you could write something that looks perfectly, a perfectly normal parallel program and get terrible performance. So uh, the question is, how do we communicate to programmers you know, what's causing your program not to run fast, right? Uh, so uh, we've got a few tools that can help you, that can help you with that. Uh, so what I'm going to do uh, is show a quick demo of how you can start with something that blocks a lot, gives you bad performance, and convert it into something that gets you very good parallel speed up. Uh, so quickly, these are basically the three, uh, the three primitives that are relevant to us here. So you, I've kind of described these a little bit. So future uh, accepts a thunk that returns a, a value of type A, of any type, uh, and returns an, a value, a future value uh, of type A. Then touch uh, accepts an argument of future of type A and returns an A eventually. Uh, and then this third thing here, visualize future as thunk. Uh, that's a primitive that we can use to actually show a graphical window that gives us a description of the timeline, the execution timeline of a future program. So this is, this is the, what we use to invoke the profiler uh, for futures. Uh, so this thing takes a thunk that returns an A and then returns an A to us. Okay, so what we have here uh, is a hopefully basic program. Uh, so this is the Mandelbrot set calculation, which you're probably all familiar with. This is a sort of canonical parallel program. Uh, so for, I don't, I'm not sure, many of you may not have seen racket code before, so just in case, I'll walk through this uh, sort of quickly. So this is kind of the entry point here, Mandelbrot set, uh, which takes three arguments, a width and a height of the image that we're going to render uh, as the Mandelbrot set. And then the number of iterations, this is the number of, of times we check to see if a certain uh, pixel coordinate is in the mail process set or not. So the way we're going to render this image is we are going to allocate a byte, a byte array of ARGB values, so width times height times four. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll write an alpha value to that byte array for each pixel uh, to, to show whether or not it's, it's in the set. Uh, and then we, we're just going to allocate, we're not allocate, we're going to assign a specific, a chunk of rows to each thread or future uh, to work on here. So now we call visualize futures thump with this entire this entire thump. So hopefully is that too dark? Can we read that? Okay. Uh, so here everything we call visualize futures thump, everything within the body of this thump is will be profiled. Uh, so this is where all the the actual parallel code is happening. So here what we're doing uh, with for with this for slash list uh, form is we p here is is an iterator so we're iterating over the number of the number of processors p is equal to the processor count uh, for each p we're going to return a future here that works on a specific set of rows in the in the image uh, so fs here will be a list of futures so. We have a list of features here, and then we will map touch over that list uh, to force each future. So, and this should be fairly self-explanatory. Here we, so we get a pixel coordinate, call in mail brought set, uh, and then set update the butter rate. So then here, in mail brought set is kind of where all the actual 
actual work happens uh, on the future. So, so we will convert the pixel coordinates to a to a number on a complex complex plane, uh, and then loop. Uh, here, this is we're basically saying define a function called loop uh, that takes three arguments, uh, initial and then call it with these initial values, and this is recursive. So if we uh, we recur uh, up until the number of iterations if we haven't ex if the magnitude of the complex number hasn't exceeded two, uh, then we stop. <coughs> so this program, I'll, I'll run this program and show you what the visualizer will will look like here. So this may take a second. So note that we're actually calling we're calling Mandelbrot set with a pretty small input size. So there's only a 16 by 16 image. Uh, we only do 16 iterations. Uh, the reason for that is that the visualizer is still kind of in its infancy, so it's it kind of slows down on large large traces. So we want to keep it for the sake of time. Uh, so okay, so what we've got here, uh, we've got a lot of information about the program that we just ran. Uh, it doesn't look very good. Uh, so we've got a utilization graph here, which is looks pretty awful. Uh, so basically, what is not a utilization graph in the normal sense you would think of it. So what we're doing is we're sampling uh, the trace at fixed intervals, uh, and we're calculating the percentage of threads that actually have a future working at that time. So it could be the case that, let's say if we sample here, we, we see a 0%. Uh, so in this timeline, all of these green uh, bars here represent time that futures are spending doing actual work. Uh, as you can see, we're almost doing no work uh, in parallel. So, uh, so you can see there, there's a lot going on here. But you, basically, what's happening is all of these these colors are kind of hard to distinguish. But these orange dots represent atomic operations. So I mentioned memory allocation as one type. Uh, also, JIT compilation is another type of atomic op. Uh, so we cannot we cannot do that safely in parallel but we can just pause the future and should compile something uh, and allow it to continue. So we see blocking it on uh, JIT compilation. Uh, and then also, if we look over here, we can see uh, sort of just a summary of all the operations that, that blocked us here, right? So we're blocking on pretty much every arithmetic operation in the program. Uh, so that's bad. And also, uh, just to note here, we also see kind of a, a tree uh, of the futures that we created. So if you, in this case, we're just creating a flat structure, and we create a sort of a dummy node at the top as the root, which is the runtime thread. Uh, if we had a recursive program that was where futures were creating other futures, we would see uh, more levels here. We can mouse over each individual node, which corresponds to one future, and see uh, what blocks that specific future encounter. So we, right, we're blocking on plus magnitude, multiply, divide, and subtract. So how do we fix this problem? Well, at least we know, we have some idea of what, what, what the problems are, right? So we know that, for example, we're probably blocking, we're definitely blocking on magnitude. Uh, we're blocking on complex number multiplication, and we're blocking on subtract and divide. So that's not good. So there are a couple of different approaches that you could take to try and fix these problems. But what we'll do here is actually convert this program to a typed racket version. Uh, so we're actually going to make this code strongly typed uh, so that we can allow the compiler to make better decisions about what code uh, is generated so we can kind of try and funnel more code through the fast path. So to do that, change the language, and then we need to do a couple of things. Um, First of all, we have to, some of the modules that we're requiring here uh, are also untyped. So we have to tell type racket uh, what the, the signatures of these functions are. So the way we do that is we say require types. So first of all, picked helpers is a helper module that uh, defines this function display bytes here. So, and that's just what converts the byte array to an actual bitmap and shows a window of the bitmap. So the type of that function, this function takes a byte array, two integers, and returns void. 
So then also, we have to tell type bracket the type of the actual visualized future response function, since it doesn't know about that. So this is a little more interesting. So visualize future is thunk. It is polymorphic. So what it does is it takes, we say for all, for all A. See, remember here we are actually, we're, so this is what we call a function, right? So we pass a thunk that returns any, right? So we say for all A, visualize future thunk takes a thunk that returns an A and then returns us an A as well. So we can remove these two here. And the only reason we don't actually have to do, like, do something similar for these two modules is that they're so part of the sort of uh, common bracket uh, collection, so they're well known to type brackets. So type bracket already knows how to sort of instantiate the types for these, uh, for these the functions that we use from those modules. So the next step here is to we actually give these functions that we've defined types themselves. We just, which is relatively straightforward. So Mandelbrot set takes three integers as arguments and returns void. And similarly for here, for in Mandelbrot set, where in Mandelbrot set takes four integers and then returns us an integer. So, and notice also that we're actually getting, we're doing online syntax checking here, online type checking here. So, we actually get feedback from the type checker as we're typing. Uh, so, the type checker is telling us at line 18 uh, that it doesn't have enough type information to type check this function. So, what we'll do uh, is annotate this for list construct and tell the type bracket what the, the type of this, the return type of this uh, form is. So, what we're actually returning here is a list of future of void, right? So, now, <coughs> so now, we have one other problem. So, touch, remember touch is also polymorphic, right? So, Type bracket understands that it's a polymorphic function, but we still need to instantiate it, this function with a type. Uh, so we need, we, we need to tell type bracket what the type of this function actually is in this case. So we say instantiate touch with a return type of void, since these are features that return void, right? Uh, so there, that's it. That's all we have to do. So notice that there's obviously a lot of type inference going on here, so we only have to make annotations in a few places to get this to work. Uh, so this looks good. Uh, we still don't know if we've fixed any of the problems that we had uh, before, uh, but what we can do, instead of actually running the visualizer and having to profile our code again, we can actually run uh, this tool called the optimization coach, which gives us sort of a, a report on how successful the compiler was at actually optimizing some of this code for us. <coughs> so what we see is we see regions that are problem code regions that are problematic highlighted in red, right? So what we can do is actually click on these regions and get an actual, an actual report that shows us source information, and the compiler can tell us why we may not be getting optimizations that we that we that we expected here. So so here's a problem. So this x here, we see it says this expression has a float type, but the sub expressions use exact arithmetic. So, what type bracket is telling us here is that we have, I'll just show you. So, this expression here, these x and w are integers. These are exact numbers. These are exact numbers. And we're actually doing arithmetic on them using floats, which are inexact precision floats, right? So, this is mixed, what we call mixed mode arithmetic, and this is not a fast math operation. Uh, so, this is a problem. Type bracket is telling us it doesn't. It doesn't know how to how to convert this, either convert the exact numbers into a floating point or optimize that operation. So what we can do to fix this problem is just convert them, write code to convert them manually. So we can convert x, y, and w to floating points using arrow fl. And then update the 
this uh, code here. Okay, so now we can run, rerun optimization code and see if that fixed, fixed our problem. Okay, so now we get green. That's, that should be better, right? So let's just check this to make sure. Okay, so we're actually looking here for red X. We want to see if, if we have any, uh, any problems here, which, as it turns out, we actually don't. So that's great. So it looks like we may not be having any slow path operations at all here. Uh, so what we'll do, just to make sure, is run this again uh, in the visualizer to see if this worked. So, uh, and here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of spoil the surprise, so I'm going to turn up the input size here. Because as it turns out, we are going to get much better performance. So, we'll try something like this. Okay, so we have a bigger image, obviously. Uh, and then we see here that the utilization graph looks much, much better. So we can tell right away that we're getting, we're actually getting at least good uh, parallel, we're, we're running features in parallel, right? And then also here, we see that we have no barricades. Uh, and the only thing that we're actually ever even pausing on is JIT compilation. Uh, and that's actually something that's somewhat unavoidable because a future will, when the future is past a thunk, that thunk has to be JIT compiled, and there's no other way to do that than to invoke the runtime thread to do it for us. Uh, but it turns out not to really be a problem. Uh, so if we look here in the timeline, I'll hide this, uh, this tree. So we can see we have lots of green bars on top of each other. So that's great. Much, much faster. And as you can see, it, I mean, it essentially took the same amount of time to run this program uh, with a much larger input size than it did with a very small input size before. Okay, so uh, to summarize, not only do we have uh, this nice approach to modifying a runtime system that's very sequential and doesn't really lend itself to parallel code uh, in a quick way, that's incremental. Uh, we can, whenever we decide that we have a primitive that uh, is causing us problems, we can decide to make that, to write a safe, a fast path for that primitive. Uh, and so we can automatically get, uh, we can run that thing in parallel. Uh, but in the meantime, while we have just a sort of rudimentary uh, implementation, we can use these tools uh, to guide us uh, and, and sort of help us write better programs now. Uh, and use, using a combination of this profiler and also uh, the type bracket uh, optimization coach. Uh, and the nice thing is that, that oftentimes, as, as I just demonstrated, we can write, we can convert a program to type bracket and get all of these things essentially free of charge. So there's really no, no extra effort, uh, just annotate your program with types uh, and you can get good parallel performance. So thanks, uh, and if, you, if you're interested, uh, I encourage you to check out the, uh, the paper on the code at this uh, link. If you have never used Racket, uh, check it out. So, thanks. Thank you. Okay, we do have time for the questions again, so maybe. It's not controversial enough. <laughs> Then I have a controversial question. Um, Manual road seems to be embarrassingly parallel. Yeah. Still, you have to do quite some twisting until you got any decent performance out of it. Can you comment on that? Is that the wrong language for the right problem, or the wrong problem for the right language? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't say it's the wrong uh, the wrong language. I think uh, we uh, obviously this is it's work in progress. So the, the core idea here is that we we've, we've been able to to modify Racket, which is a huge runtime system, uh, and really really fast to support parallelism. But we're not really there yet. So we have something that works, but we're very conservative about what we can actually run in parallel. Probably too conservative. So there are many primitives that we probably could just declare yes, these are safe to run in parallel, but we don't at this at this point. 
So that's why there's this, this extra work that needs to be done to to get to really really efficient fast path operations. But I think we're you know we're we're getting there. I think you know as we as we you know improve the implementation. So. So this is a kind of general question. Um, I, I was expecting to come today and not see any lists. I thought I would be seeing arrays of trees. Um, but I'm looking at figure nine, and I see an FFT flying on lists of floats. Uh, is there a reason that, that we're using lists for these data structures? You know, uh, and probably a lot of people have seen Guy Steele go around and give this talk about um, how lists are not the right data structure for parallels. But more than that, I find that it's just a struggle for us to get decent uh, parallel concurrent garbage collectors. So, Anything that's increasing our application traffic more than uh, absolutely necessary is got to parallelism. Right. Uh, and actually, it's, it's a little bit worse than, than you described because often <laughs> lists are uh, often lists don't really don't necessarily work well in, our, in this big specific case of our implementation. Uh, so we're usually forced to use a flat structure like an array or, or something like that, uh, just because we it's better for us to avoid. Uh, lots of allocation. Um, there are still issues with some. If we want to define a tree, like a tree structure, in Racket, there are still problems there. We still might block uh, on some primitives that we probably shouldn't be blocking on. Uh, so we have to stick to very basic uh, structures. So. Any other? Well, then, let's thank Steve again.